Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's 1010 webinar on foreign participation in European standardization. So, as usual, I am your webinar moderator of today. My name is Els, and uh, I will guide you a bit uh, or present you a bit, uh, presenter. Uh, first of all, please uh, bear in mind that. Uh, that you're all muted, so you, you do not have the possibility to uh, speak out loud, but you do have that question and answer panel that you can use for submitting your questions. So we have 30 minutes for the presentation, and afterwards we will have a look at your questions and reply them. Should your question not be replied today, you will find it back on the website uh, as soon as possible, including, of course, the answer. Uh, we are also on Twitter, so please feel free to use the hashtag 1010webinar to tweet about this webinar today. So, let me introduce the speaker of today. Her name is Joshua Shen, sorry, and she will talk uh, about the foreign participation in European standardization work today. The floor is yours, Joshua. Thank you, Els. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar um, about foreign participation in European standardization work. In other words, um, in, in the standardization world or in the sense analytic community, we also call that foreign observership. Um, it's, it, it's a rather, it, I think it's a rather coined term that we have created. Um, it, in, in, it, may, it refers to accepting foreign observers in European TC. I'm going to address this topic uh, through the following aspects. What added value does foreign participation bring to European standardization? Who can participate? Who are participating? How can they participate? Who decides if they can or not? Can observerships be terminated? And once become, they become observers, what rights and obligations do they have? Before I uh, telling, tell you about how useful foreign observerships are, um, let's look at a bigger context, um, because foreign observerships or foreign participation is an important tool, but one of, but only one of the tools that SENS and ELEC have for cooperating with foreign partners. And the rationale for SEN and SENELEC to cooperate with foreign partners are as follows. Um, we aim for technical alignment, uh, which means removal of technical barriers to trade and foster global competitiveness for our industry. Um, we support the supremacy of ISO IEC deliverables. We want them to be adopted everywhere. Um, and we, our slogan is ISO and IEC first. Bilateral cooperation between SEN and, and between SEN Senelec and um, third country national standards bodies are, for us, complementary means to foster technical alignment and to accompany regulatory convergence. Um, it's not our responsibility to ensure regular, re regulatory convergence because they are the responsibility. Uh, the responsibility lies with. Um, public authorities, um, as, as standards bodies, um, standardization accompanies regulatory convergence. And we are also re receiving increasing requests from other countries for adopting your, to adopt European standards as their national standards and to establish formal partnerships. Sometimes such requests are out of political context, such as trade negotiations. Um, and Sometimes we, uh, we, uh, we in, in many of these mm, are for our information exchanges, uh, for uh, an increasing, enhancing mutual uh, understanding of each other's um, standardization systems, uh, exchange of expertise, etc. Now to address those needs. Um, then Senelec uh, adopts the following approaches uh, in international cooperation, and, and, and our levels of activities are categorized in the following five. Um, at the top of the pyramid is our engagement in ISO-IEC. By statute, 
then all SEN and SENELEC members must be members of ISO IEC. And, and, I, SEN, and SENELEC also have uh, Vienna and Frankfurt agreements respectively with ISO IEC for technical cooperation. Um, besides ISO IEC, there are bilateral partnership models and we also have projects in specific strategic countries supporting uh, strategic cooperation and technical bilateral technical alignment. Uh, complementary, no, actually, in fact, um, such strategic cooperation technical alignment we also promote the supremacy of ISO IEC standards. And then we complement that with uh, bilateral cooperation. Um, we disseminate homegrown ENs to countries who have the need. And we support EU regulatory dialogues and trade negotiations. Now, these high level strategic needs for international cooperation are then translated into more specific needs at, inter at technical level and foreign participation um, is addressing the technical need. Uh, specifically from the European side, there might be a need for specific expertise that exists only outside of Europe. There might be an interest in specific expertise for particular reasons such as uh, the work is more advanced in certain country or regions. Um, there's no existing international work, but uh, there's a mutual interest from both sides to work together. Uh, some, uh, very often to prepare the ground for international work. And for, for our foreign partners, uh, they have the need to access to European know-how uh, to prepare for the EU accession process. Uh, this is particularly applied to affiliate status, which I will explain later. Um, they have, uh, our partners are interested to influence the development of European standards and or to adopt European standards. Now, who can participate then in European Technical Committee? There are certain preconditions to be met to become a foreign observer of SEN and SENELEC. Observers must represent their national TC with the same scope. They must be nominated by the National Standards Body or National Committee. And for those who are not familiar with the terms NSB or NC, uh, for your information, uh, NSB, National Standards Body is a term referring to um, the standards body represented, for example, in ISO, um, and the, the recognized standards body in a certain country um, represented in ISO. And NSV is used more in the ISO SEN context. And likewise, National Committee is used in the IEC and SENELEC context. Uh, and then the NSV and NC must be a member of ISO IEC, uh, there must be an official request from them to SEN and SENELEC. Um, the reason that we require that observers must be nominated by the National Standards Body and, and, and national, or National Committee is that SEN and SENELEC function based on national delegation principle. The experts in European TCs don't represent their individual companies' positions but the positions of their national mirror com committees. The same principle, therefore, is applied to foreign observers. So if you are a company and you want to represent your national interest, you, sorry, your, your company interest, then you can do it at national level, at a certain European national TC. Or, uh, yeah, I think that's the, or, or through, a, a national trade association who participates in the national in the national TC. But if you are joining a European uh, standardization work, technical work, then what you represent cannot be your company's position, but must be the national TC's position. There are certain, the foreign observerships, as I mentioned before, is an, is an important tool for international cooperation and is embedded in 
in some formal cooperation frame frameworks of CEN and CINELEC. Here you can see the, uh, an overview of the different uh, cooperation frameworks that we have. Um, the highlighted ones, the ones in red and in orange, are the ones that, we, that, that foreign observerships are embedded. Um, and they have different, um, but they are embedded with different degrees of um, obligations and, uh, and, 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 and rights, um, and which I will explain later. For affiliate, and the, uh, but now I will explain a little bit on the different frameworks. Um, the affiliates is the concept of affiliate, affiliation to Sen and Sinelec is defined in Sen Sinelec Guide 12. And they mainly apply to, con to the national standards bodies or national committees of countries who are formally recognized by the European Union as being potential candidates for EU membership. Therefore, by formally recognized as potential candidate or can accession countries, they have certain obligations at a higher political level, at member states level, as as a, a, as a accession country, uh, to regarding legislation and standards. They have a stronger need to adopt the category, the, 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 to adopt European standards as their national standards and um, to, to transpose European directives to their national directives. Therefore, this um, concept uh, is embedding many rights and obligations associated with the rights and obligations of their accession or candidate country status. And then companion standards bodies, um, is, um, they apply to any national uh, standards bodies or national committees outside of the sen like membership that are not affiliates, but they also must be members of ISO and IEC. Currently, CEN has 17 companion standards bodies and CEN elect 10. Uh, the more majority are in countries of the European neighborhood policy, um, and, but also uh, Canada, Australia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and New Zealand are, all, uh, are also our compa uh, 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 companion standards bodies. Um, companion standards bodies reflect the need for the countries of the, of, of the relevant national standards bodies or national uh, committees to get close closer to European the system or to uh, they have a, a higher need in adopting European standards or access or participation in European technical work. Um, both affiliates and companion standards bodies, they're one-stop shop for uh, adoption of European standards. They go to our web, uh, we have IT tools where they um, they they have it, there's a very simplified pr process for them to uh, view, uh, download, and notify adoption of European standards. Uh, the one-stop shop refers to that uh, uh, to those IT tools, and of course, companion standards bodies have different rights and obligations uh, and, and than those of affiliates, um, which I will also explain later. Uh, mainly that they don't have the uh, obligations to adopt the your, all European standards developed by the TCs they observe. Um, and then cooperation agreements are applied to uh, countries of strategic importance uh, for Europe and that send similar, for, for SEN and CENELEC. Um, and we currently have five cooperation agreements um, with China, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and Canada. Uh, indeed, the cooperation agreement with Canada does not apply to technical agreement. It's more high-level uh, political cooperation. But uh, the cooperation agreement with Japan and Russia do uh, cover techni technical cooperation. And Japan is sending um, observers to eight European TCs, and Russia used to send that now well, we have suspended uh, all the observerships. And now, we also have memorandums of understanding with regional standards bodies, such as uh, the Mercosur Standards Organization, uh, the, with, with uh, and, uh, the um, uh, African 
San, a regional standards body uh, with the Gulf states, with the Pan-American Standardization uh, Committee, um, etc. Um, both cooperation agreements and MOUs um, uh, must be based on reciprocity and commitment and transparency, and they are strategic. <clears throat> um, they do not automatically um, um, touch upon technical cooperation unless speci specifically uh, expressed in the agreement. Uh, affiliates and companion standards bodies, they do have automatic uh, rights to, to, to uh, adoption of ENs and uh, technical um, um, cooperation you know, and, and TC observership. Um, and there are other, uh, if, you're, if your uh, NSB or NC do not belong to any of these categories, the ones highlighted here, there's still a chance to participate. There's still, it, it is still possible to participate in European TCs, but it's only on a case by case basis. I will explain also later how they can do that. Here is in the map uh, that show, gives you an idea of the global outreach of, uh, of SENS MLX International Corporation. Who are participating in European TCs? Here's an overview. There are 18 non-European NSBs or NCs observing 175 SEN and SENELEC TCs. The countries are listed here. As you can see, it's quite consistent with, with the status. Uh, affiliates are observing more. Uh, affiliates and CSBs are the higher observers. Um, mainly, and the cooperation agreement uh, we, we is reflected here in as Japan uh, in the middle. Eight uh, eight TCs are they are observing eight TCs. Mm. Then TC two seven five food analysis horizontal methods has the most non European observers um, from six um, NSBs and NCs. And the business and civil engineering sector uh, has the most uh, non-European observerships, 50 of them, um, from the following um, NSBs and NCs, part, foreign partners. The, the green ones are uh, affiliates, and the, um, uh, the brownish yellow ones are the um, uh, companion standards bodies. And then that is followed by mechanical engineering sector with 45 observerships, <clears throat> with one additional, which is Japan. Uh, besides affiliates and companion standards bodies, we have also Japan, who is a cooperation partner uh, observing um, this sector. How can our foreign part partners participate in European TCs and who decides if they can or not? Um, for different cooperation uh, frameworks, there are different approval processes. The affiliates, the, the request for observerships are automatically granted by their status. And for companion standards bodies, they are entitled to request on an a unlimited number of TCs, but they need TC to approve them. Cooperation agree agreements have a predefined list of uh, TCs to observe upon mutual interest and specified in the agreement and assessed by the TCs throughout the cooperation time frame and, uh, and assessed on an annual basis. And others, as I mentioned before, there are also other routes. Now, if you don't belong to affiliates or CSVs or cooperation agreements, then you can join through the ISO or IEC route, which needs an ISO or IEC TC decision, then followed by a SEN SEMELEC TC approval. Um, but what is to be remembered is that the, the position then represented in the European TC is the position of the ISO or IEC TC. 
not the position of the national standards body itself. Or a national standards body or national committee can directly approach Sentinel like management center, uh, even if they don't belong to any of those categories, um, the Sensei Lake Management Center then will contact our, our TC, uh, which will discuss and decide if such um, observerships could be granted, but they will not be given priority. Uh, all requests, it, it, sh it should be remembered that all requests should go through Sensei Lake Management Center to process. Uh, the Department of Market Perspectives and Innovation, which is my department, deals with international cooperation matters. Now we have so many observers. Can we, can any, in, in any um, point of time, can they be terminated? Yes, of course. Uh, the answer is definite. Um, they can be terminated by observers themselves or, or, or the NSBs or NNCs. Uh, because they no longer have the need, uh, or because the observers themselves have changed jobs, they need to change in that way, they need to change in, uh, observers, in which case an NSV and or NC must send a new request to replace the observers. And then it can be terminated by mutual agreement in the case of a cooperation agreement, for example, between Sense and Like and the partner, uh, partner NSV or NNC. Mm -hmm. It can be terminated by our European TCs on grounds of observers not full, fulfilling their obligations, which leads to lack of reciprocity, commitment, and transparency. And we have cases, uh, for example, Senelec TC 80, uh, 82, uh, photovoltaic, uh, if I remember correctly, that's the title of the TC. Uh, decided to terminate an observership of, of, of Japan uh, because the Japanese experts were not contributing to uh, the work of the TC. Uh, they do not bring the added value that was expected from them. They do not report uh, as, uh, as uh, expected as or as stated in, in the cooperation agreement. Therefore, we, have, we decided that the observership should be ended. And also, we, European TCs can uh, request to invite foreign observers, um, um, which is the case um, uh, of a new, new SEN TC for, uh, for services for senior people or if I, I'm not sure that's the right title. Because <laughs> mm. we, um, the TC would like to invite uh, Japanese experts, understandably Japanese, uh, Japan is quite advanced in providing services to older citizens. And therefore their experiences could be uh, useful uh, for, the, uh, for the work of the European TC which has uh, just or shortly been established. And lastly, we, uh, I'm going to talk about the rights and obligations of foreign observers. Mm -hmm. The observers have the right to access all TC uh, or subcommittee or working group documents and meetings, um, unless the TC decides Otherwise, now the TC can decide that they can grant the access only to TC level, uh, or they can also grant the access if requested specifically to specific working group level. Mm -hmm. And they can send a maximum of three experts plus one interpreter to each TC they are going to they want to observe. They can submit comments to the working group the working documents. It's up to the TC or the working group to decide if they want to accept them. They can circulate the draft submitted to inquiry, UAP, or formal vote in accordance with Guide 10. Uh, uh, 
in 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 the TC or working group. Yet, besides rights, they have obligations. They are obliged to limit the circulation of documents in their own TC only. They cannot circulate the documents beyond their mirror TC. They they must inform the European TC of national deviation of special national condition during the Senelec drafting process. This applies to all observerships. And for affiliates, they need to withdraw conflicting national standards. And for the others, they are encouraged to. They must comply with sensimilar like internal regulations. They, com they must comply with sensimilar like guide 10 on distribution of European standards and, and, uh, and implementation. Representing the views, they must represent the views of the mirror TC versus company views. Um, they, one, the thing that must be highlighted here that there is an annual reporting obligation. Uh, they report the current state of play in the sector that they represent. They use they re, must re, they must report on the use made of the standards of the TC if they have been adopted as national standards not um, with modifications or not um, and how and they also need to inform the TC of the planned activities uh, in, in their uh, in, in their country and if these information are not shared. Uh, they, they cannot commit to share this information and contribute actively with, with the relevant information, then the European TC um, would decide to suspend the observership. Okay, then we have reached to the end of my presentation. These are the key learning points. Um, European standardization work is open to foreign observers. And our standardization system functions based on national delegation principles. So observers cannot represent individual companies' interest, but the corresponding national TC's position. The European TC's are the, are the ultimate decision makers to approve or disapprove an observership request. I would like to add here also, if a, a, TC, a European TC decision for terminating a uh, observership or rejecting an observership request has not been accepted by our partner, then we can move to a higher level of decision-making body. Uh, in this um, can be the technical board. Uh, and observerships can be terminated and, it has been, and they have been cases that they have been terminated. Uh, there are obligations observers which, when unmet, could become grounds for termination. <laughs>